church, you are here for the first Sunday of 2021. Give yourself a round of applause, guys. 2021, you made it. You have perfect attendance right now for the new year. I'm so proud of all of you. And come on, I mean, who is not excited that 2020 is over? I've actually compiled... I have compiled 13 days of video footage of everything bad that happened to me in 2020. And that's all we're going to play. I just want to walk through the horrors of my life of 2020. Uh, but we have a lot to look forward to as a church in 2021. Individually, I hope, as well as a church. I mean, uh, we really are believing God's allowing us to open up three campuses this year, right? Two in the spring, Stony Brook. Holbrook, and then hopefully in the fall, we are still believing for Pastor Bill uh, launching a campus there somewhere in central Nassau. We're still looking and praying for a space for that. Uh, it's exciting. But you know, here's the thing. We also need to be realistic when it comes to a new year. Because the change of one day or one year isn't going to change us. Right? It doesn't work that way. I, I mean, you, you, maybe you were still up on December 31st at 11.59 p.m. You were not different then, right, on January 1st at 12 a.m. It, it doesn't work like that. Time doesn't fix the problems in our life, and it doesn't fix things that we need to work on as the people of God. If we want something different, then we need to decide to be something different. Amen? We need to make the choice. You know, I started uh, praying months ago about what to do as we go into the new year, especially after the year that we've just had. Started praying like, God, what do you want us to do in the new year? Because here's the thing. Even though, you know, the date doesn't change us, there is something significant about a new year mentally and emotionally for a lot of people. There, there is some weight in saying, no, all right, we're, we're closing a chapter into a new chapter. And as I was praying about it, I kept coming back to this simple idea that we as a church just need to encounter God more. I mean, that's what it comes down to. With, with everything else going on in our life, uh, with a lot of the hardships that have happened, with, with where a lot of us are spiritually because of how, how we were so thrown off in 2020, we need to encounter God more. And the number one thing we need as individuals and as a church is really more of God. Amen? Like, like you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> but, but I really believe like that's, that's what God is speaking to us as center point, as a local church here on Long Island. And I felt the Lord was challenging me, challenging us to be very intentional about what that means to encounter God. And the Lord put it on my heart, and I don't say that often. I try not to over-spiritualize anything that, um, that I, I'm not like super sure this is how God wants me to express it. But I do believe that the Lord put upon my heart to start this new year with us collectively doing something that will connect us more to Christ. I I'm going to say this right off the bat to set up the framework for the rest of our time. But I, I believe God wants us to fast as a church for 21 days. Really starting tomorrow. And I'm going to go into all the details about this as we keep going. But I, I believe God wants us to fast as a church body for 21 days. 21 days of us saying we need more of God. And we're going to be intentional in our lives to get it. Because encountering God is exactly what fasting is all about. Uh, when we think of fasting, some of you already may be wondering, like, all right, what, what does that mean? Like, I, I had to fast for my colonoscopy. Is, 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 that, is that what we're talking about, right? Does this mean that I don't eat for 21 days? Like, what, what's the deal? And I'm going to explain it all to you, and I'm going to give it to you in bite sizes if you've never done anything like this before. But I, I think that there's so much that we collectively as a church in this new year can do, fasting from specific things so that we can focus on God and to grow. So let me start by giving you a quick definition of fasting. This is important. Fasting is the voluntary denial from a particular activity over a period of time for an intentional spiritual purpose. 
there's really two big pictures here that I want us to, to look at as we're, we're understanding what fasting is. The first is a, a voluntary denial. It's not forced. It's not coerced. It's not manipulated. This is, this is us saying, no, I want to do this. I, I, I want to step away from this. And it could be food. It could be social media. There, there's multiple things that you could fast from. But it's you intentionally and voluntarily denying something that is a consistent and regular part of your life for the second part so that you can now intentionally focus on a spiritual purpose. So you can say, all right, I, I want to grow in God or I'm seeking God on this or, or it's going to be something with our walk with Christ for real growth. And that's what I'm asking us as a church to do. And here's what's interesting about fasting. I know a lot of us may have never done it before. It may not be part of our regular rhythm of spiritual formation and disciplines, but, but Jesus didn't give us an option not to fast. He never gave us the option not to do it. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 16, Jesus is talking about fasting. And this is what he says. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. And he gives a little lesson here on how to fast properly and the attitude, the outward expression of that fasting. But what jumps out at me here is Jesus says, when you fast. See, also in Matthew chapter 6, he says a few other statements like this. He says, when you give, and then teaches how to give properly. He says, when you pray, and then teaches how to pray properly. And he says, when you fast, and he teaches how to fast properly. Here's my point. When he's saying this when statement, he's assuming that this is something people are already doing and will continue to do. And so if you are a follower of Christ, Jesus is already assuming in the way he's phrasing this statement that this is part of the spiritual disciplines in our life. It's interesting, of all the things he could have mentioned, he says this is how you need to fast. Yet fasting is often a spiritual discipline that I don't think a lot of us apply that's unfortunate because it can be a huge tool for spiritual growth, especially in our world right now of overindulgence and, and excessiveness. I, I mean, we have so much of everything. If there's ever a time where it may be important in human history to say, I need to put some of these, these things aside so I can have less for a moment, I think right now is that time. And here's one of the many things that I love about Jesus even when it comes to fasting, Jesus always leads by example. He always leads by example. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. I, I want to look at Jesus in fasting to learn about us in fasting. And let me give you some quick context of Matthew 4. We just have to look behind Matthew 4 and Matthew 3 real quickly to understand what is going on. Because in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus was just baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, heaven opened up and a, a dove or an image of a dove came and, and landed on Jesus. The, the heavens opened and the Father spoke to the Son and God said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What an incredible moment for Jesus as his father says these words to him. And you see, Jesus is now about to start what is often called his earthly ministry. He's now been baptized. We have this moment of the father and the Holy Spirit and the son. And Jesus now is about to go preach. But there's one more thing that needs to happen before he's released to start preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And this is where we are, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says this. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I find this whole part so interesting. Because Jesus is to have this intense and deep encounter with the Father through a time of fasting, solitude, and testing. And I just want you to think about that. If Jesus needed to fast and have solitude to be closer to the Father, to be prepared for what is next, don't you think we will as well? Right? I mean, it's Jesus. It's the Son of God. 
He needed to do this. How much more do you think this needs to be part of our rhythm of our life? And it's here that I think we can learn so much about the significance of fasting as we see what happens while he is in the desert as he's being tempted. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at the temptations of Jesus while he's, being, while he's fasting and get three things from it that I think are really significant as we start our fast, hopefully as early as tomorrow. And here's the first thing I want you to know about fasting. Fasting replaces our physical distractions. Fasting replaces our physical distractions. It goes on. Chapter 4, verse 3. It says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. All right. This isn't in my notes. I'm, I'm going to totally go over. I already know that right now. Okay, so I'm so sorry. But I just, it's so rich. I, I want you just to remember, Jesus is often called the second Adam, right? And if you go back to the Garden of Eden, we have Adam and Eve, and they fall. And they fall when the tempter, when Satan comes, and he says to Eve, did God really say not to eat the fruit? What Satan did to Eve in that moment is he convinced her to doubt the words of God. Now we had just read the chapter before. What does God say to Jesus? This is my son. And the devil, like he's got one playbook, friends. Like it's pretty simple. He gets us to try to doubt the words of God. That is what he does. And so he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God... He's trying to manipulate the words of Jesus, uh, God. He's trying to create some doubt. And I want you to know this. Man, if the word of God says it, then you can bank on it. You can believe it. You can trust it. Do not let the devil take what is true and pervert it and twist it in just such a way to get you to doubt it. Amen? All right, that's a freebie. All right, that's just just a little extra for you right there. I, I had too many Red Bulls. You can tell. I need a hanky. All right, so here it goes. All right, sorry, verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we just learned that Jesus is 40 days into his fast. And he's hungry, right? I think that's a bit of an understatement. By the way, when you read that, he's hungry. If I miss lunch, I'm hangry, right? If I miss lunch and dinner, I'm ready to dumpster dive. If I miss two days of food, I will kill you and eat you. I will. I'll just put a little red, uh, red hot on your bicep. It'll be delicious. It's all good. I will go to cannibalism very quickly. Jesus is 40 days in. Jesus was hungry. (laughs) Jesus was famished, guys. Jesus was beside himself with the physical realities of hunger as he is 40 days into this. And then suddenly, the tempter, Satan, shows up. All right, I wasn't going to do this, but I have a second freebie right here, all right? I'm sorry. This is going to be a long sermon. I apologize. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, w- w- when Satan shows up, he's not going to show up when you're feeling your strongest. He's not going to show up when you are just on cloud nine. You are with the Lord. Everything is going great. He's not going to waste his time when everything seems great. You know what Satan's going to do? He's going to wait until you are weak. So you are exhausted, so you're emotionally and spiritually shot. That's when he's going to bring that temptation that he knows that you are more likely to fall to. It's in those moments that you have to be the wisest and the most alert because he knows that it's going to be your downfall if he can just get a little whisper in your ear to tempt you to something that he knows will bring you away from God. All right, second freebie, I'm sorry. So then suddenly the tempter Satan shows up. Now, some believe that Satan physically showed up, like Jesus sees him in front of him, like he's there in the flesh. Others believe that Jesus is being tempted by Satan, and and kind of the way you and I are. I've never seen Satan pop up and be like, Brian, you know? 
eat this. It's evil. Now, when, when I'm tempted, it's, it's the thoughts. It's the whisper in the ear. It's this, it's this, this subtleness that, that you don't even realize that you're being tempted. Those are the scariest. So I don't know what's actually happening here. But either way, this is what we do know. It is a direct temptation from the devil. And he tempts Jesus in the most obvious way in this scenario. To satisfy his own hunger pains. In essence, the devil's saying, just eat something. You have the power. You can do whatever you want. What would be the big deal? There's just rocks right there. You could just speak to the rocks. And they would become bread. They become Panera bread. <laughs> they become Krispy Kreme donuts. He's just like, just say it. And it's yours. But Jesus' fast wasn't over. It wasn't yet time to eat. This is still a time dedicated to God alone. And Jesus tells the devil that it's about God first. Even over every physical desire he may have, even if it is so great, it doesn't matter. This is a time dedicated to the Lord and nothing else. And here's what I think we can learn about fasting and our own fasting as we move forward from this. Because when it comes to fasting, we are deliberately removing something normal and natural from our life to use that time and energy to focus on the spiritual. In this case, Jesus is fasting from food. You can, again, fast from social media. You, you can fast from so many different things that have a normal part of your life that you can be drawn to, but you're doing it for the reason of getting rid of physical distractions, uh, things that become consuming, things that start taking up a lot of time. Again, even if they're good, you're doing it to create a new space, a new moment where you can put that energy towards connecting with God. When you voluntarily deny the flesh, it helps bring the spiritual ultimately into focus. Does anyone else out there need help uh, focusing through all of life's distractions? I, I mean, life is chaotic. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to focus on so many different things. When you have your phone constantly going off, I have an Apple Watch, this thing's pinging all day. I know it's rude. It, it annoys some of our staff when we're in a conversation and I'm constantly doing this or, you know, I'm kissing my wife and I'm like, oh, hold on. I, I need to check my Facebook post. She gets mad at that for some reason. I, I don't know why, but but I'm, I'm someone who just gets super distracted all the time, and it's bad. I, I'm, just, I'm so focused when it comes to church, but when I get home, I lose that focus quickly. And my wife likes to mess with me on this. She likes to buy things and put it in the house and see if I'll notice. And she'll go hours, days, weeks, months, really wondering, will I notice the change she has made? And this has happened. She's done a little remodeling in 2020. It was one of our soothing things, right? You're in the house more. Let's fix some things up. And every time I would come home, I would never notice. And the worst was just a few months ago. We were laughing about this earlier today. Um, a few months ago, I came home and... You know, our home's small. We have a little living room kitchen area when you first walk in. And I walked in and talked to my wife. We had dinner in that same area. We sat down in front of the TV. We watched TV all night. Finally, it's time to go to bed. And she starts laughing. And she's like, are you serious? I'm like, what? She's like, you really didn't notice. You're messing with me right now. I'm like, notice what? She's like, for real? I'm like, yes, I love you, babe. I notice you. You're amazing. She's like, no, not me. Did you notice the rug? And sure enough, I look down. And this isn't like a two-by-two two rug, people. This is a nine-by-twelve rug. It takes up our living room. It went from beige to bright red. And I didn't notice. Here's the thing. That's bad. And I think that's how a lot of us are in life. And that's how a lot of us are with God. Like we're just so busy, we're so distracted, our brain is always going that if we aren't intentional on stopping, we're not going to see what God is doing. We're not going to see the things he's changing, the opportunities he's presenting, and they can be all around us without us noticing unless we find replacements of these physical things in our life to give real time to growing in God. 
Fasting takes us out of our normal rhythm to help us see the things that we might have otherwise missed. Does that sound good? Second thing I want you to see is that fasting reveals God's plan for our life. Fasting reveals God's plan for our life. Let's look at the second temptation here. Verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Real quick, the devil is quoting from Psalm 91. Oh, freebie three here, all right? (laughs) The third one is I want you to see that the devil knows the word of God inside and out, and he is using it and manipulating it and using it for his purposes, not God's purposes. There are going to be times in your life when you are going to meet people like this that know scripture so well. They're so proficient in it. They can tell you the Greek and the Hebrew. They have it all down, and you think they're such a person of God, but if their heart is not in the right place, they can be just like the devil, abusing scripture to lead people astray, abusing scripture so they can have a position Position of authority in your life. You always have to check the heart and the character of someone with the word of God, not just the knowledge of the word of God that they have. That's important. That's my third freebie right there, right? Let's keep going. This is going to be a long sermon. It's actually not. I got this, guys. And then he says, this is Jesus' response to the devil. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil tempts. And Jesus responds. So we have the devil. He's now taking Jesus to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the the highest point. We're we're, we're not sure how they got there. Maybe Jesus is actually really good at parkour, just one of those spiritual gifts that we never heard about. He scaled the temple walls. We don't know. Maybe it's an illusion. Maybe it's in his head. Maybe it's just Jesus' thoughts as he's tempted of the what-if scenario. But regardless, this is playing out. And Jesus could be there. And think about it, if he did this, if he jumped off from the the highest point and angels came and saved him in front of all these people, Jesus would have been an instant celebrity if he would have gone this route, right? Uh, His TikTok followers would have blown up. It would have been so massive for Jesus to have this entry in the beginning of his ministry like this. Instantly being seen, his angels grabbing him, saving him, elevating him. Yet Jesus pretty much says to the devil as he's tempted in this way this, that's not the plan that God has for me. That's that's not what's supposed to happen. See, what Satan is trying to do is to get Jesus to act and then hope God steps in to help. It's just like when we sometimes take our plans and then say, God, this is what I've come up with. This is what I'm, I'm hoping to accomplish. Now, God, I need you to come and bless it. I have it all figured out. I have it all mapped out. I, I have my future all set up. God, now I'm asking you as I'm jumping, I need you to come and, and bless this so it can go the way that I'm hoping it could ultimately go. And what fasting does is fasting brings us back to what Jesus says here to the devil. Do not test God. See, when we fast, we are to come humbly before God. When we're giving up something that we enjoy, that we love, that we like, it's us saying, no, I'm going to come to something better than this. We come to God saying, no, we, we are here because we want more of you. We want what you want for us. Like, this is, this is why we find ourselves in this position right now. And I think one of the mistakes that often happens when we fast is we're doing it saying, listen, if, if I really sacrifice, I bet you I can change the mind of God, right? Like if I, if I really show him how serious I am, I'm, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to do this for a, a lengthy period of time, then God's going to give me what I ultimately want in my life. But I want you to know that's, <laughs> that's not the point of fasting, The point of fasting is the exact opposite. It's not, God, give me what I want. It's saying, God, what do you want for me? It's such an important difference. And friends, as we're doing this, we're coming to God with an openness saying, God, whatever you have for me, I want to see that. That's the path I want to go down. That's what I want to hear from you, God. Not not what I want and trying to convince you. I want to know what you want, and I want you to convince me. (laughs) Point it out. Show me so I can go in that direction. 
do not put the Lord to the test. Instead, ask God for the answers to his test. God, what do you want? Most of the fasts that I've done in my life have been for this very reason. A real desire and a hunger to say, God, what, what is your will? The bigger the decision, the longer I had fasted. Uh, for example, before I started Centerpoint, uh, I got you, gotta let you guys know, like that, that was a, a long season of anguish. As much as I felt called to do it and wanted to do it, I still wasn't sure, was this me or was it God? Uh, was it something that a friend put the idea in my head or did the Spirit of God use him to put the idea in my head? And I started to wrestle through this and I, I, I spent a long period of time, I don't remember now and I don't want to lie, but it was a lengthy time just fasting from food and saying, God, do you want me to start this church? And I fasted until I heard the answer. And I believed God said yes. Before I married my wife, Sarah, listen, there is no decision bigger outside of putting your faith in Jesus than you will ever make than the person that you marry. Uh, we believe as Christians that when you get married, you are married for life till death do us part. That is a big deal. We don't go into it saying, oh, if I fall out of love, it's okay. I can just move on. Absolutely not. And so when I was marrying my wife, knowing that I'm making a lifetime commitment, no matter what happens, I fasted people. <laughs> I spent a long time, I think it was the longest fast I ever did, it was about 20 days, where I just said, God, let me know, is this the person you want me to marry? Is who, is, who I'm to spend the rest of my life with? Is this who's going to help me in ministry? Because I needed to know not what simply my emotions were telling me, not what my desires were telling me, but what was God telling me? I married her. It was a good 20 days, I'll tell you. That paid off really well. <laughs> but you get the point here. We fast to reveal God's plan for our life. And God has one for each and every one, but it takes humility on our part to seek it out. It takes, for real, guys, it takes such a level of, of humility to say, I, I'm not going to simply base my life on what I want, the direction I want my life to go. I truly want to know, and I'm going to spend time trying to figure out what does God want from my life. Because when you start living that way, I'm going to tell you, you're going to take different paths than you never expected to take. He has a good, pleasing, and perfect will for you. Are you willing to pursue it? Third and final Fasting reveals what controls us. Fasting reveals what controls us. Look at the third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said. If you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This might at first seem a little strange and confusing, like well, why would Jesus even consider this for a second? Right? The devil is, is going to, to get Jesus, the, the son of God, God in flesh, to worship him? But Satan was counting on Jesus' weakness of flesh. Instead, Jesus had a strong spirit. And what's interesting is I was thinking about this temptation. I, I was just realizing that Jesus knew that the purpose of his life was ultimately to lead to the cross, right? The cross that he, he sweat blood about before he ends up on it. Like he, part of him is dreading in his humanity the cross. This isn't something he's like, woohoo, the cross! No, he's like, God, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And the devil might not have known it at this point, but it had to be in the back of the mind of Christ. Satan's tempting him with all the kingdoms. And I wonder if there was even a second where Jesus is like, man, maybe there could be a different way. Scripture says that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. The, the temptation part is still real for Christ. Maybe instead I, I could just become an earthly king and, and, and lead everyone to righteousness that way. Maybe, maybe there is a different way outside of the cross, outside of a horrible death. 
I think that this was meant to see if Jesus would put something ultimately over the will of the Father. If something else could control him before he started the ministry that God had set for him. As I think about that, I realize this important thing about fasting. That fasting actually creates an important moment of honesty within oneself. Who are you really? It, it creates a moment of honesty. See, two weeks ago in, at Center Point here, uh, we taught uh, about worship and creating false idols, golden calves uh, that we could find to worship in our life. And the thing is that we learned that these idols often control us. They become our gods. Work, relationships, family, wealth. I mean, you, you name it. You can put almost anything in there. Yet when we fast, we often become so aware of what we desire in the flesh. Fasting reveals our deeper passions for things not of God. It, it brings our struggles to the surface. And this is where the direct confrontation of our flesh and the spirit comes into play. Because fasting is a battle within your desires. If you've ever done it, you've felt that tension. Uh, I, I feel that I need to fast. I, <clears throat> for example, need to not eat, but my hunger is saying, give to the flesh. When I'm trying to give more to the spirit. And when you abstain from things, even good things, you learn how much control these things and how much power these things actually have over you. Because you feel the draw and the temptation to take them back. To stop focusing on the Lord the way that you're trying to. Friends, we will have many temptations that can ultimately control us. Things that will take our attention off the Lord. But Jesus reminds Satan of what we need to remember too. That we are to worship the Lord our God and serve him only. Who is your God? Who is the Lord of your life? Satan tried, but Jesus pointed it back to where all worship is deserved. Back to the Father. The only way to win the battle over our flesh is to confront it. And put it over God. Not to ignore it or deny it or hope it never re reveals its head because it will. And fasting provides that opportunity to spiritually wrestle in a way I think sometimes we try to avoid because wrestling is so exhausting. But we need to if we are to grow and to get stronger. To overcome and to be victorious. Friends, I think all of 2020... COVID and elections and all of the other things that have happened last year. I, I believe not that it was done for this reason, but it certainly created this. It, it's created a moment of testing in the wilderness. As I look at 2020, that's what it's done. It, it is testing of our, our soul and our character and our integrity and our godliness in the wilderness of, of struggle. And I think it's been setting us up personally and corporately as a church also for what's next. God wants to make sure that we are ready before he releases us. Jesus had to go through this before his ministry began. And for the next, se uh, for the next season of ministry in our lives as a church and individually, I, I think you need to go through a season of testing and preparation to know that you are ready for wherever God wants to take you. The worst thing that can happen is God lets us go with our desires before we've become spiritually mature enough to overcome the temptation that will also come with those desires. I think that's what 2020 has been. And now we're ready. <laughs> we're looking to what is new. But we have to finalize it in our hearts. We need to say, no, God, before anything else comes, before Holbrook is opened or Stony Brook or Central Nassau, uh, before that promotion in my, my job, or this new opportunity within the church, this new relationship that you're opening up, I need to make sure that I am right with you so I don't put anything else above you. And so here's the challenge, friends. Will you give God 21 days? It's my ask. For some of you, this is going to be the, the biggest spiritual challenge that you have ever come to. It's the biggest thing that I think we've ever done as a church in this regard. We've never fasted for 21 days before corporately. But will you give God 21 days? 
And to help you, we've put together what I believe is an incredible resource on fasting, on scripture reading, on a daily devotion and reflection questions. We've put together everything, not physically on paper this time. We have it all online. I'm even going to put the website out real real quick here for each and every one of us. It's cbchurch.com slash encounter. And here you're going to find more information about fasting, more information on on how to do it, what it is, what not to do. To be smart, uh, I mean, if if you have an eating uh, disability, here's the one thing I never want you to do. I don't want you to fast from food. I want you to fast from something else. We need to be smart. If you have physical health issues, then, then don't fast from food. Fast from something else. But for many of us, I think the food fast component is going to be a big part of this. And so for the 21 days, I'm personally, I'm going to be doing a juice fast. We, we have a Daniel fast listed and what that could be. Maybe some of you are going to fast for a meal a day. Like you're going to fast every breakfast. And every breakfast, you're going to spend that time more with God than you normally would. Others, you're going to do other kinds of fasting through this period. But what would it look like? To give God this intentional fasting of 21 days as we start off the new year. Listen, I want you to know you can't fast from your family. That doesn't count. All right? You can't fast from your job. I'm not going to sign any papers for you. They can hand in like, oh, I have a religious you know, reason not to be at work for the next 21 days. We're not, we're not doing that. But I think here is this amazing opportunity For us as God's people to say, we want more of you. And we're not going to stop until we encounter you in a fresh way, like what we have seen in the past. If we want our lives to change, then we must be intentional and willing to take major steps to bring that change. Let us cry out to God with such a fervor and such a hunger. That says, God, we're all in. Because we know we need more of you to help us overcome the hurts and the brokenness and the challenges and the frustrations of last year. But even more importantly, to set us up for you want to take us as we move ahead. Church, will you do this journey with us? I'm going to close in prayer and just pray for God to give us the strength through this. I'm going to encourage the campus pastors at every campus to, to come on up in the worship team. And then whether you're online or, or in one of our locations, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together as his people. Let me pray. God, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for Jesus, how you were willing to model what we need to do. And I pray for this time, and I, I pray for the next 21 days. Maybe we're starting tomorrow. Maybe others have to start later in the week. I, I don't care when you start, but God, may, may we be willing to make a commitment to give something up, Lord, so that we can create new space, new time to focus on you, so we can hear your will for our life, so we can wrestle through desires that are in our flesh, God, so that we can ultimately be victorious, Lord, because we want you and you alone to be the Lord of our life. And so, Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity. May it change our church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen.